you very much, Kanag, and uh, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, inviting me along here today. Incredible um, list of people attending, so I'll, I'll try not to uh, cheat the proverbial sucking of eggs here. But what I do want to do is to put into context uh, a few areas of uh, policy. I think that what I really want to focus on is looking at economic policy, energy policy, and the investment needed uh, to put those policies into place. And, and looking at then what the implications are for renewables in Wales. So that, that's the plan. I'm focusing on economics, <coughs> energy, and investment. Um, there are, as we know, incredible pressures on the energy sector, on energy policy. And we've only had this morning, of course, the Prime Minister is actually going to be talking about how we're going to reduce the bills for, for consumers going forward. But what tends to happen, of course, is that as these issues arise, you get a focus, and politicians themselves have to focus on environmental policy, talking about and focusing on climate change. You have to look at social policy, and the problems that we just mentioned with the, the prices, fuel poverty, and economic policy, about how we're going to get a competitive economy uh, within, within Europe, etc. And in some sense, we don't have a proper energy policy. Energy sort of comes through gaps, you know, it evolves to fill, to fill these gaps. There's no real focus on energy. I think the last 20 years, I think everybody will agree, you know, there has been no energy policy and such. And that's why we're in the state we're in. But the essential point of course, of energy policy should be to keep the lights on. Now, in the UK, energy policy more and more these days is focusing on and emphasizing these issues of security, of supply, and diversity. And we're looking for that secure mix of fuels for energy generation. Wind energy and other renewables, of course, are an essential element of this mix, and that's where we have to see them being promoted. They offer an environmental solution, of course, to energy generation, and they offer an effective way to meet our carbon targets. And a number of other areas, of course, that we could mention about jobs and um, <coughs> other opportunities for economic development. In terms of our carbon reduction targets, and Peter, is, Peter Davis has, has, has gone through on, on some of these this morning, and very well highlighted these, and he's talked about the need for streamlining. Well, of course, when you look at what's actually happening on the ground, we've got these quite ambitious targets. You've got the EU's target to cut emissions by 20%. The UK then wanted to raise these to 30% by 2027. But of course, on the ground, carbon emissions are actually increasing by 3%. And we now have a statement from the UK Chancellor that we are holding back now from going any further and faster than anybody else in Europe. We, we, we don't want to be this, this leader out there in the front uh, taking on this challenge. And we are very aware, as we've mentioned this morning, of these increases um, in cost. And you can see um, from this, uh, this graph from, from the FT, you know, we were going down that yellow route as, as our baseline target, if you like, going forward to 2030. And then we've gone further and gone down the the blue line, cutting, cutting um, carbon emissions faster, etc., taking that lead. And even on the yellow line, we know that somebody has to pay for it. And the costs, in terms of, of uh, household energy bills, are, is likely to rise. And between 20, 2011 and 2020, they're likely to double. And that's been the big, um, the big issue that a lot of people are beginning to, to worry about. And of course, the same will happen for um, industrial energy prices as well. Now, the point that we really have to remember, this is the context, the first context I wanted to put up and, um, and just get some, some debate going. Of course, it's a global issue. And this is a nice little graph um, from, from 2007 indicating where energy comes from at the moment. Coal, oil, gas, etc. dominating. And the renewable section, very, very small indeed. Most of it actually of hydro and combustible waste. And a very, we're talking really, I suppose, about this small little 
the category here of global energy. That's what we're trying to sort of get people to realize that we should now be investing in and promoting and switching uh, to some extent from these other from these other areas. That was 2007. Can you give this video? I don't know whether everybody could see those big enough for people to actually read okay. Um, <clears throat> you can see here that from the BP's uh, forecast, and these are very similar um, to the OECD forecast and the IEA's forecast, etc. So 2010, you've got 11 billion tons of oil um, uh, being pumped, or well, being used effectively, the total energy consumption on the bottom here. And that's expected and forecast to rise to over 16 billion then by 2030. Um, oil will still represent, even by 2030, 28%. Well, those are, you know, those are percentages, but just not by those. Multiply those by 100. So it's 28%. It'll go from 33 to 28%. Natural gas will increase slightly. Coal will slightly come down as a percentage of the total. But you'll see all of them are actually going up, trending upwards, and all are expected to be increased. Um, hydro uh, also is going to go up. Renewables, of course, are going to go up fastest. But even so, by 20. Uh, it's, it's still unlikely to, to, to reach more than about <coughs> true renewables, taking out hydro, will only reach about 5% uh, of, of the total. So it's a global issue. So we, you know, we shouldn't get carried away with thinking that whether we go for a 20% target in this country to a 25% target in this country by 2030, by 2040, whatever, it's going to make a, a huge impact on that, on that global trend. We've got, to, we've got to be mindful of what is happening in the global economy. Now in the UK, we're thinking of um, focusing on the next decade in this way, raising renewables then to 30% uh, of total energy, reducing coal to 12%, reducing gas, and uh, keeping nuclear about the same. That's roughly where we're, we're heading as a, as a country. And the cost of that, both the cost of that switch in energy use and the cost of replenishing our energy generation, which is already um, uh, coming up for renewal, the cost of that is quite significant. We'll come to that in a minute. In, in, a minute. in fact, it, it is about 200 billion, but that's for the first 10 years. We're talking about the cost then of the carbon budget, legally binding carbon budgets that we're going to have to meet um, will require radical change in power generation and distribution in favor of carbons. And Ofgem has estimated that just to keep the lights on by 2020 and achieve this switch in, in, in actual uh, generation from, from oil and coal to more to renewables, it will cost about 200 billion. And as we've said, uh, electric, electricity bills are likely to rise to at least 2,000 pounds by 2020. Now, <clears throat> What is the, you know, to, can I just put that into context as well? Um, first of all, looking at the, um, the cost of um, the splitting it up, if you like, where is it going to come from? Well, the, the switch to renewables, actually building in renewables into the, um, the actual energy mix. Is, is estimated cost about it's going to require investment of about 112 billion. And it's better to look at it in that way. It's about investment. It's an investment of 112 billion to get us towards that, that target in terms of renewables. We need to re, re, you know, replace the transmission and distribution. Uh, other areas we will need to operate in, very obvious. And that adds up then to, to 200 billion. And you know, in terms of the uh, pie chart that people have a visual estimate of that, you can see that it's the investment in renewables that is going to be the biggest chunk then of that total, uh, that total investment with distribution coming up as a, as, as, uh, in second place. But huge investments then are going to be required. Now, if this energy restructuring requires this massive uh, private investment to deliver clean energy, we have to think that weights could really do with some of that investment. Because low levels of investment in Wales have been a problem for us for at least the last 20 years and probably longer. And we've had a very poorly performing economy and the fuel poverty in Wales is high because people are generally poor. 
you know, it's a bit of a misnomer if we talk about fuel poverty. People are poor, and that's the issue. And how do you raise prosperity from uh, in an area, of course, which is at the bottom of the league in terms of UK prosperity? We definitely need more investment. In terms of per capita, typically Wales gets about five percent of whatever happens in the UK. You know, that's the bar that fall the type of uh, adjustment, if you like. Um, so we would expect 5% of that, that investment of 10 million. But of course, Wales is actually blessed with a lot of good resources for carbon, uh, for reducing carbon, and for generating uh, energy in a more sustainable way. We have significant low carbon resources. So in terms of aspirations, we should be looking for more than 10 million. We should be looking at least to get about 10% of that because of our position, and because of our, 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 our existing investment in energy, we should be able to get about 20 billion of that investment uh, into Wales. Now, putting that again into some sort of context, what's 20 billion? I mean, these numbers. I was at a, I was at a, um, a debate here, and somebody sort of mentioned how long it takes you to count out a billion. So if you went, how long do you count out a billion? If you had one, two, three, if you went like that, for, for a billion, huh? how many seconds would that take us? Well, you count out a billion, it actually takes you about, about 32 days or something like that. That should be, go like that, you would just be counting 32 solid 24 hours a day. And if you were to count out the, the size of our national debt, you would, you know, you would have to start it when Henry VIII was on the <laughs> Just counted that. So these are huge numbers, and it needs to be put into context. So putting it into context, what is 20 billion? What is 2 billion pounds per annum? How much do we invest in Wales? Well, this year, the local authorities, all 22 local authorities, capital investment expenditure for all local authorities will be about 1 billion pounds. That's how much they will invest this year in, in infrastructure, in, in various other areas of school research. Wow! The Welsh Assembly Government's capital budget for this year, for 2011-2012, is £1.43 billion. Pounds. So the capital spend you know, in Wales is in that sort of level. And we're talking about £2 billion per annum, which could be here for investment in energy. It is not an insignificant amount. It would, in fact, almost double the amount of investment that is going into our infrastructure uh, in Wales. And of course, the problem is that the capital spending will just forecast to fall over the next three or four years because of the cuts, because that's where the cuts are actually being targeted on, on actually cutting back on the capital side of it. So it's absolutely <coughs> vital that we take this um, into account. Um, if you do a straightforward economic impact analysis of, the, um, of that sort of money, and you look at, uh, you know, if it was 2,000, million pounds coming in from, from, from the direct investment, if you like. The indirect impact of that, the induced effects of that on, on people's incomes and further consumption, then the total in income impact it could be in excess of 2.5 billion uh, per annum. Gross in that up over 20, over, 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 over 10 years, you would, you would get numbers of that sort of magnitude. And the, the jobs linked into that, the jobs actually linked into that, you know, we're talking about 15,000 jobs to be generated over that period of time. Again, not in significant amounts, but you've got the highest level of unemployment in the UK, in Wales, over 8.5% at the moment, and of course, especially among young people. Again, put that into context. Most of the studies of green jobs in the UK, I mean, admittedly by the Carbon Trust and uh, uh, British Wind Energy Association, when they were called that, and other people, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? But the government's own estimates as well suggest that if we did invest in renewables, and, and, and all that investment that we're talking about re re replacing the, the energy uh, infrastructure, so you're talking about 130,000 direct jobs by 2020. Carbon Trust has, has estimated 50,000 jobs included within that 130,000 from offshore wind uh, uh, by 2020. And if we actually focused on inward investment and getting some manufacturing uh, sector jobs 
through perhaps inward investment from turbine manufacturers, then there's an additional 14,000 estimated to come from that particular direction. So again, you see, Wales could capture with 10% of these jobs. That's where those jobs match up, if you like. 13,000 jobs, 15,000 jobs with the, with, with the, with the multi-product factor, etc. Um, and it seems to me that it, it, this is what we need to be doing now. We need to highlight the economic and community benefits of investment in renewables. That's really part of the, the state that I want to make today, really. And the impact on employment and GDP growth. Because there are tremendous opportunities here in supply chains. But we need to take action now, really, to maximize um, this, this impact. Because if, when you look at <coughs> wind, we have tremendous resources for wind. Let's just look at that for a, for a moment. It's the fastest growing renewable sector. It's the most mature sector. Yes, and I'm pleased to see we've got a lot of investors here and, and, uh, and uh, uh, chief executives from, from other renewables, particularly new forms of renewables, tidal, wave, etc. And, that, and that's brilliant. That will take a lot of investment to get that effectively into the market. But wind is a mature sector, so 20% of that 200 billion could be expected to be in the wind power. I'll get to remember that that's a very important element, about 4 billion, about 4 billion pounds. But when you look at wind, this is just an example because it could be the same thing with, with, with tidal and other technologies, and I just happen to know a lot more about the wind industry. 65% of that industry will go on turbines. Yes, there'll be civil works, yes, there'll be grid connections, etc. Obviously, there's be legal and, and financial um, implications, various developing costs. But the biggest element will be in investment in turbines. So turbine manufacturers are absolutely key to the growth, to the GDP, to the jobs. A typical <laughs> two megawatt wind turbine then costs about 2.5 million pounds. 50 megawatt typical size wind farm there, you know, would require an investment of about 5 billion in, uh, in, in, in turbines. But of course they generate then electricity for 25 years, and the spin-off for local communities you know, is 10 million pounds plus for local communities over, over that period of time, if we get it right. And of course, there's even more spin-off if we can get the manufacturing sector right. And this is an area, and again, people talk about streamlining, and it's so important that we get our act together in this area because we need to manufacture more of that hardware. And, and I think it's going to take an activist industrial policy in both the UK and the Wales to get this right. You've only got to look at the countries out there who've been successful in this area. Germany and Denmark and Europe have been successful. And they've been successful through dedicated activist intervention by the government, creating the right conditions for those industries to take off, for those sectors to grow. And you, and you, you need to think about Korea and China, because you can imagine the bit. <coughs> Do we just um, uh, uh, approaches of those economies to getting these sectors up and running? And they are, of course, now beginning to dominate this whole area. So we need to be leading the engineering side of this. This is where we need to be investing. And of course, with that comes skills. We need a massive investment in skills uh, to make sure that we're in a position to grow this area indigenously as well as attract um, inward investment. Because even the inward investment is not going to come here unless, of course, we've got more skills. And as I said, the forecast uh, is exponential growth, obviously, for this sector. So it, it's, it's, it's really is important that we get it right. If we do get it right, you know, we're in line to, to actually be leading the Europeans, the European Union's agenda, which is to achieve investment through innovation, through investment in innovation, <coughs> green and sustainable energy solutions. That is their view of where Europe wants to be, and that for me uh, suggests that the UK and Wales could equally be going very strongly in that direction. So finally, you know, this is the context then. Um, we need, I think, to focus on highlighting renewable energy as a solution to our economic problems, particularly the economic problems facing work, but it, 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 it's also at, at a UK level. You know, we know all of that, you know, closed, closed down uh, areas, 
in the valleys, up in Anglesey, etc. Um, uh, industrial parks, uh, empty and vacant. You know, we need to be addressing this. The Scots, you see, they got a lot of energy already over the North Sea oil, etc. But they've seen that with peak oil and other issues, they need to be in here. They develop their supply chains. They've actually got a good strategic focus on maximizing the economic impact of renewables in Scotland. And we also need a challenge, and I'm sure people are here today who will be wanting to do this, and will be a far better place than me to do it, is to challenge these damaging manufactured images of renewable energy that are being produced by the anti-wind lobby and other anti-renewable uh, energy groups here. These manufactured images suggesting that we're going to be completely covered with turbines. You know, you can see that Edward Vaughan tells me that none of those turbines would actually work because the turbulence from one to the other obviously would be such that they would be completely ineffective and inefficient. These are manufactured images, of course, just to give people a frightened image of what their um, rural area is going to look like. Yeah. And then we will be dominated by massive distribution networks that are there and needs, we need that distribution as a economy to just a, a competitive economy going forward. So, just to conclude, that without highlighting these economic arguments in favour of renewables, really focusing on the great opportunities that are out there, I think the inevitable reaction from, from voters and consumers will be this. And this is taken from The Economist, and it's about Australia, so I don't hold that against them, um, especially with Friday morning coming up uh, very soon. Um, you know, five, six years ago, everybody was in favour of doing something about that. You know, should we take immediate action? Yes, we're going to take immediate action to sort out climate change. Well, well some people thought perhaps gradual action would do. And there was a few people who said, no, no, we don't want to take any action. But you see, by 2011, the same continuous uh, polls are showing people are moving away from this. We are losing the argument. We're losing the argument, we're <coughs> preaching at people, and we're not offering them the real, the real sort of meat, if you like, of the argument, which is about uh, economic development, economic prosperity, and the way in which we need to have an economy based on renewables in order to actually um, both save the planet and improve our prosperity, particularly amongst the most the poorest sections of the world. So instead of just talking about climate change per se, which you know, we have to do, we have to uh, uh, say that it's an important sector, it's an important problem, we have to take action. But we also need to refocus, I think, the debate. And that's what I take coming out of Peter's talk this morning. We need to be streamlining this debate to focus it on to what are the jobs out there? Interesting, skilled jobs. Economic growth and quite considerable community benefits and jobs in areas that desperately need them. That's the focus that I would suggest we need to focus on more and more. And thank you very much for this.